Hello and welcome to another edition of Bread Theory. I am Zach. I'm your host tonight. Uh, we're going to be continuing on with our theory audiobooks. We are in the middle of Peter Kropotkin's A, Quan A Conquest of Bread, or The Conquest of Bread, I should say. Uh, we are on chapter 14 tonight, and that is about consumption and production. Uh, don't have a guest tonight. It's just going to be me and uh, you all in chat, so feel free to leave your questions or, or comments or whatever you're, you're thinking about right now. Um, if you like that opening video, that, that is actually a video that I shot, uh, just going around some of the, the city lakes in, in the Twin Cities. I, I plan on using that for um, some uh, lo-fi theory uh, videos that I'm going to be doing, where I will take probably that footage uh, specifically, as well as lecture audio from, let's see, I, I've already done um, Michael Brooks, and I did uh, the Communist Manifesto uh, audiobook, and I'm going to continue on with a lecture from another famous leftist. Not sure which one yet, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll set that to the the video as well as some some lo-fi beats just in the background, uh, just as another way for people to kind of absorb theory. If, if reading uh, print is is too distracting, and you know you find trouble with with getting through audiobooks you just need something more a little more stimulating especially visually stimulating to to keep your mind focused uh that's the idea is, is for for those sorts of people uh but without f further ado i think we'll get into tonight's chapter uh again that is we're doing chapter 14 conquest of bread and i'll be stopping um Whenever I feel like it, and also if you guys have any questions, I can I can stop and answer those as well. Uh, so let's let's get into it. Let's let's see what uh, Mr. Kropotkin has to say about consumption and production under an anarchist system. This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchists. Chapter fourteen. Consumption and audio production. Just a bit here. Let me know how the levels are too. Looking at society like and its voice political to be about organization from a different standpoint than the, that of the authoritarian the schools, where we start from a free individual to reach a free society, instead of beginning by the state to come down to the individual, we follow the same method in economic question. We study the needs of individuals and the means by which they satisfy them before discussing production, exchange, taxation, government, etc. To begin with, the difference may appear trifling, but in reality it upsets official political economy. If you open the works of any economist, you will find that he begins with production, the analysis of means employed nowadays for the creation of wealth, division of labor, manufacture, machinery, accumulation of capital. From Adam Smith to Marx, all have proceeded along these lines. Only in the latter parts of their books do they treat of consumption, that is to say, of the means necessary to satisfy the needs of individuals, and, moreover, they confine themselves to explaining how riches are divided among those who vie with one another. So Kropotkin's chief concern here is that most economists, in, in his mind, look at things backwards. They, they start with um, production, and they just kind of lump labor in with all the machinery and all of the infrastructure needed to produce things. Uh, just as, as another, uh, you know, living component of the way that uh, capitalists, the owner class, make their money through, through their, just by their being the owners of it. So he thinks that's, that's backwards. We should look at the needs of people first and, and consider what level of production we need to meet those needs. Um, in his mind also, you know, looking back at some of the chapters we've covered already, uh, that's a much more efficient way of doing things. You don't have people working jobs that, that are meaningless, you know? Uh, you don't have a 40-hour work week for every single job because not every single job requires 40 hours a week uh, to do it. I'm, I'm sure we can all relate. We've probably all had jobs where there's tons of downtime, where we're just collecting a paycheck and, you know, no, nothing is really going on with, with anything that we're contributing. Um, so it was like, why, why, why waste all that effort? Why waste all that time? Why waste everyone's time in this sort of production? Why not instead look at how much we have to produce 
and and of course in Kropotkin system we're even doing away with with things like uh, money so you know get rid of that altogether and and look at just what needs to be produced uh, have people produce it based on on you know what uh, guild or, or worker cooperative they, they wish to join and, and will have them uh, and that they have you know the right skills or potential for and then we'll just keep on producing stuff and distributing it as needed um, so that kind of flips everything on its head I mean everyone thinks of capitalism as this super efficient system just because well just because people say it is that that's just the part of the mythology surrounding capitalism that doesn't necessarily bear out in the real world uh, there's a there's another book I'm reading on my own called bullshit jobs by David Graeber and he's going into all these different professions that have been created that literally do nothing to, to further the goods or the services that a given industry produces. You know, things like uh, managers who hire a bunch of, I think he called them flunkies, uh, basically just people that are, are, are yes people. Uh, they're there to make the, the, the boss look good and to show that the, the boss is an important person. You know, he's talking about how back in uh, the days of aristocracies, there'd be plenty of people that they would hire just to stand there in, like, you know, very uh, smart looking uniforms just to make the king and the queen and, and all the royalty look good. You know, that, that spent most of their time doing absolutely nothing other than being, you know, window dressing basically for other rich and fancy and powerful people. Um, so that applies as well to, to capitalist systems. Um, and, and Graeber was talking also that another advantage of, of hiring a bunch of underlings that, that don't actually do anything is, is when it comes time to fire or lay people off, well, you have a bunch of people that you can fire and, and show just, just how much you're trimming the fat and, and, and working for the company. Uh, you know, no mention that they never did anything to begin with and that their, their positions won't be missed, but, but that's, that's another matter. So, yeah. Oh, let's see what we got. Oh, boy. We already have some ableism. <laughs> uh, just run around in the woods and wipe your butt with leaves if you want to experience it. That's not at all what anarchism is, you know. And if you read some of this book, which I really encourage you to do on your own. I know we're, we're 14 chapters into it. Anarchism is the lack of hierarchy. So that's the, the, the archy part of it. Anarchism. And means none. Archy it refers to hierarchy. So meaning no hierarchy, or as close as we can get to it, you know. There, there would still be people of skill that, that are in particular positions um, at their workplace. Nothing wrong with that, um, with having the most skilled people do whatever they're most skilled at. But at the same time, everybody needs basic things. Food, water, shelter, uh, education, transportation, access to health care, access to uh, communication devices. Um, access to community. These are all essential things for, for human thriving. And these are the things that if we were to just give everyone them, would create a platform for them to stand up and uh, not have to worry about the threat of starvation from the capitalist class for, for not working in a particularly bad job where they get paid just enough to scrape by, if, if even that. Um, but instead, it would empower them to actually have choice, perhaps for the first time in their life. Uh, to, to work something that they may actually be interested in. Uh, and then also, when they are working, to actually have a democratic say in the goings-on of, of that operation. Uh, to treat everyone on the same level when it comes to the important things. Uh, you know, we think democracy is a really good thing for uh, politics. Why, why is it so good for political life, but, but not so good for economic life? And for the life that, that people spend most of the day at, which is their day job. Eight hours a day is the biggest chunk of your working life, even if you take into consideration the weekends. Um, so to have little to no say in that entire chunk of your life, that, that chunk that you derive all of the necessities of life from and you are dependent on for all those things, including healthcare in the U.S. in many cases, uh... That just doesn't seem right to, to have it all be dictated from the top, to, to give ourselves over to the whims of people that just happen to be in a position to own. 
Uh, why not instead put in democracy and freedom and, and self-direction, um, self-determination? Why are these, these things that we have to check at the door when we go to work? You know, and this is what Kropotkin's talking about when he talks about anarchy. It's not no rules, la la la, you'll just, you know, burn and loot and, and uh, everyone just does whatever they feel like. That's, that's, that's what anarchy has been branded as. Guess by who? By the people that, that, that stand to benefit the most from keeping things as they are, keeping themselves on top. Uh, but, but anarchy... And, and communism and labor organization that has come from those sorts of efforts has given us things like the 40-hour work week, uh, the eight-hour day, which could even be less at this point. By all accounts, we, we work too much as a species, way more than we need to, especially when we look at how much work is out there that, that just literally does not need to be done, literally contributes nothing or actively harms the world. Um, but uh, safe working conditions, uh, increases in pay, pensions, all, all these sorts of things have been won in spite of capitalism, not because of it. And they, they have come from people on the actual left, uh, labor organizers, anarchists, many of which who have, have died for uh, their cause at the hands of police, um, at the hands of uh, just the government in general. Um, sentencing them to death for, for their supposed crimes. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's interesting how, how terms can be warped and twisted just because you happen to be in a position of power. You know, you get to control the narrative in many ways. But that's not at all what anarchism is about. That, that's just silliness. I mean, that may be a, a middle schooler's definition of it, but what do they really know? I mean, not, not much yet. And that's not, that's not a dig at middle schoolers. They're just haven't had the world experience to, to know any better. Um, anarchism is about egalitarianism. It's about uh, sharing all the things that we have and working together. It, it, it views humanity as, as it's at its best when it works together. That's how we've built great cities. That's how we've built up great academic cr traditions and literary traditions. Um, every good thing you could say about the human race has come from cooperation, not necessarily, and often in spite of, competition. Uh, you think about things like patent law, how many people that's hold, held back just because a certain company owns an idea. Well, how much more richer intellectually could the world be if we did away with those sorts of laws, if knowledge was freely available to everyone, especially life-saving knowledge? What about medical knowledge? What about the knowledge of, of, of growing things in a more sustainable way? What if that was free to all to, to build on and contribute to? Um, so yeah, keep those sorts of things in mind as we listen here. <laughs> or maybe just become a better troll. I don't know. You're probably not even here anymore. So anyway, let's continue on in the chapter. For their possession. Perhaps you will say this is logical. Before satisfying needs, you must create the wherewithal to satisfy them. But before producing anything... Thing. Must you not feel the need of it? Is it not necessity that first drove man to hunt, to raise cattle, to cultivate land, to make implements, and later on to invent machinery? Is it not the study of needs that should govern production? It would therefore be quite as logical to begin by considering needs and afterwards to discuss the means of production in order to satisfy these needs. This is precisely what we mean to do. Hmm? But as soon as we look at it from this point of view, Political economy entirely changes its aspect. It ceases to be a simple description of facts and becomes a science. We can define it as the study of the needs of humanity and the means of satisfying them with the least possible waste of human energy. Yeah, that's exactly what I was just trying to describe. This is some of the ideas he's covered in previous chapters about how wasteful this current system is. Um, the, the amount of, of needless toil just to, and you know, and he's talking about the, the aspect of all the time and energy is that's, that's used just to enrich the pockets of, of the owning class. Um, so because you, the way the system works, the way capitalism works, if you own the means of production, you get to decide what happens to all the revenue that comes in. Of course, you have to pay your workers for them to be able to keep coming to work. So 
as an owner, you are incentivized to give them the, the minimum uh, that you can give them to keep them coming in, basically. It's a combination of giving them enough so that they don't starve, uh, so that they have some sort of place to live, and, and you know, depending on the, the position and its, its level within the company, um, just enough so that they won't go somewhere else uh, or, or take some different sort of work. Um, and then everything else you get to decide because you are the owner. So a lot of the, the production that, that happens, you know, you may satisfy that, that amount as a, as a worker, just take whatever field you're in. You may satisfy enough to, to meet your salary demands, um, plus all the maintenance of whatever equipment you use, enough that the, the, the system could keep pre perpetuating itself. You may make that point halfway through your day. You may have generated enough money for your company halfway through the day. You don't just get to go, to go home. The rest of your day that you're required to work, you're making all profit for whoever's at the top or wherever they want to direct that money to go. But still, you don't get a say. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the big critique of capitalism is that there's no reason for, for these people to be at the top and just arbitrarily make all these decisions uh, when everyone is contributing to the, the good or the service that, that a particular company is making. And you're wasting so much of your time, in essence, just enriching your boss's pockets. Or not, not necessarily even your boss, but the, the boss of the company, the owner of the company. Um, so Kropotkin says, let's, let's cut out all that, that waste. That's all just wasted effort just for the benefit of, of the very small few. Um, why do that? Why, why have a system that, that works people so hard when it doesn't have to? We could have things be a lot better, a lot more uh, easygoing, really. A lot less hard on people's bodies and, and their minds uh, and still accomplish all the things that we accomplish as societies. We just won't have people that, that get to then hoard all that excess effort, you know, transformed into, into riches for them, um, for themselves. That's, that's the big difference. But that, that cuts away all the, the, the excess work that's being done a lot more efficient than even capitalism. Its true name should be physiology of society. It constitutes a parallel science to the physiology of plants and animals, which also is the study of the needs of plants and animals and the most advantageous ways of satisfying them. In the series of social sciences, the economy... So the, these are the beginnings of a sort of eco-anarchy, of, of not just taking into account the needs of humanity, but, but expanding that egalitarian bubble to even include the plant and animal world. You know, how about that? How about we, ex you know, we can, we can meet all our needs right now today for the entire world with, with the, our current production levels. We may have to up distribution in certain places but that can be accomplished too we could do it why not then take all of that security and extend it out to the the plants and the animals that we depend on to keep on living uh, not just for for food for sustenance but for fuel for for fiber like wood um, for all these different uses pharmacy all this different stuff um, why not extend it out into that world? And, and the way that I think we can do it best is by taking in some, some other ideas that have come later on, uh, almost a century later than, than this book was written. In the 1970s, uh, a guy named Bill Mollison in Tasmania, Australia, was a professor there at the University of Tasmania, I believe. And him and his, uh, his grad student, his grad intern, um, or graduate assistant, I should say, came up with this idea that they ended up terming permaculture. Uh, and the, the, the biggest piece of literature to come out of that, the most impactful one, was, was one of the first. It was called Permacul Permaculture, a Designer's Manual. It's unfortunately out of print now, but there's a lot of places that you can still get it um, for free, actually. And in fact, when I, when I make the, the YouTube video of this, I'll, I'll try and remember right now. In fact, I'll look it up right now so I have a tab open to remind myself uh, to put this in the show notes where you too can find permaculture, a designer's manual. And that talks about ways of living with the earth instead of against it. 
um, it talks about things like stacking functions. Uh, whoops, I'm not good at typing and talking at the same time. Designer's manual PDF. Let's look up that. Oh, where did that go? There we go. Uh, it, it mostly has been applied to agriculture, but it can be applied to any design system. I think it should be applied a lot more to city design. There's a lots of there's lots of, of, of the principles and the ethics that can be applied to that uh, as well to make cities better. And the three guiding ethics of permaculture are uh, care for the earth, uh, care for people, and return the surplus, whatever surplus you have, in service of the first two. I think those are three pretty good ethics that, that, that jive really well with things like anarchy um, or even communism. Any, any, pretty much any leftist thought, anyone that, that's concerning themselves with a more egalitarian a more free and a more democratic world uh, should find uh, a lot of um, commonality with these three ethics of uh, earth care, people care, and it's, it's been, it's been uh, said as, as fair share, but, but really the, the longer form, the not as, not as rhymy, neat version is, is return the surplus to the, to the service of the first two. So anyway, you can get this PDF for free um, oh, maybe we're not going to do that one. That one's not secure. But there's a number of places where you can get it. Um, let's try this one. Okay. Someday we'll go through this text too. This is definitely going to be uh, one of the big texts that we cover. So here it is. Permaculture, a designer's manual by Bill Mollison. Uh, you can see there's, there's a whole lot of imagery within this this one piece of artwork that was created for it. You have a tree, which is a fruiting tree, so it has multiple uses. Also birds nest in it. There's a snake, which forms an infinity, which talks about the cycles of nature. Uh, so you have leaves that fall off the tree that get composted just by nature into soil, which then feeds the roots and, and uh, comes back up to the tree. There's, there's constant cycles. There's air cycles. There's water cycles. You have water that comes into the ground, gets taken up by the tree roots, and it's called evapotranspiration. That's basically tree sweat. And it pushes it out into the atmosphere. In fact, entire weather systems can be formed if you have enough trees all together. That's what happens in the Amazon basin. There are so many trees, so many living things just respiring, basically, uh, breathing out. Uh, with, with a little bit of moisture in each breath that it, it creates entire weather systems um, that, that are just internal to the continent, usually. Uh, so we have different sorts of ecosystems. We have an aquatic one on the right side. Uh, let's see. Let me see how well you can see this on your... Oh, yeah. Good. Um, we have a, a terrestrial one on the left side of, of the infinity circle. This rainbow is, is a aboriginal uh, sort of motif they believed in this thing called the dream time, where your dreams actually, I, I'm really unfamiliar with it, so this is, you know, this is a very basic understanding of it. But basically, they, they, they thought that your dreams affected reality, and that you, you look at a, a canyon, they imagine it being carved by a rainbow serpent or something like that in the dream time. Um, and then also that the snake forms both an egg shape, which is you know a symbol of, of, of energy, of, of compactness, um, of new life, regeneration, all these sorts of things. But if you look closely, it also kind of looks like a skull. So we have life and birth in the same image. Or, I'm, I'm sorry, death and birth in the same image. That's what I meant to say. And then, of course, different, different elements, the sun, the rain, the clouds, the soil, all these sorts of things coming together to, to form an ecosystem. So I highly recommend this. You can search it out, and again, I will leave... You know, in fact, I will, uh, I'll put it up right now in the comments so that you can, to, so that you too can check this out. I highly recommend this book and I'm kind of toying with the idea of, of going ahead and, uh, covering this book after I get, I, I want to get one more theory book from a communist perspective and one more from an anarchist perspective. And then I think we'll have enough enough of a, a, a beginner's level understanding of, of leftism uh, that we can start folding in some of these other traditions. So I want to do 
permaculture. I also want to bring in ideas of new urbanism. Now, new urbanism really would jive well with permaculture and also with, with anarchy or basically any leftist theory. Ways of designing your city affect how you can do things like organize and distribute resources and make sure that you have an ecosystem that's functioning uh, for the future. All these sorts of things go together and, and what I really want to do is kind of combine those three main theories, anarchism, new urbanism, permaculture, in, into try and synthesize it into one unified theory, which, which I call Solaris, which means of the sun. And I've termed it that because the sun to me represents interconnection. It's responsible for oh, it and other stars are responsible for all the energy and all the matter that we interact with on a daily basis, you know, even down to the, the uh, nuclear radiation from the center of the Earth. Um, that at one time was an element in another star. All the matter that composes your body was at one time matter that composed a, that was part of a star. All the energy that comes into the, the, our Earth, whether, and, and whether we use that as fossil fuels, that's just stored sunlight. Whether we use it as wind, wind is driven by the sun. Whether we use wave power, again, by wind, um, which is driven by the sun. Whether it's directly through solar. All the, the energy that we use is in some way related to the sun or other stars. So here's that link right now. I'm going to paste it right in. So you too can go check out Permaculture Designer's Manual. Um, I'd like very much for you guys to, to look into that. Um, it's just, it's great stuff. So we won't get any more into that today, but just know it's by Bill Mollison, Permaculture, a Designer's Manual, um, and you can get PDFs. And there's pretty high quality scans of the entire book. Um, and I think you are justified in, in getting this for free. Uh, no matter what your income level is, just because it's it's out of press, so they're just they're not making any more of it, which means that to to get an actual copy is easily a hundred dollars on Amazon, or I mean that's really the only place they've even found a hardcover copy of it. Um, so yeah, I think this is incredibly important knowledge, and everyone should be able to have access to it. All right, well let's get back. Let's get back to uh, the book at hand tonight. Let's let's continue on here. Oh, one second. Anatomy of human there societies takes the place occupied in the series of biological sciences by the physiology of organic bodies. We say here are human beings united in a society. All feel the need of living in healthy, the houses. The savage's hut no longer satisfies them. They require a more or less comfortable solid shelter. The question is then whether man's not not the best turn of phrase there. The, the savage's hut no longer uh, suffices for them. That, that's <laughs> that's pretty condescending to people that live in, in but even continue to live in tribes and bands today. There's nothing wrong with that sort of life. Um, it would be great if if there was enough room on the earth for everyone to live uh, so close to the land that they were on. I don't think that's possible anymore, unfortunately. Um, but, but regardless, people that, that have lived that way, people that do live that way, are, they're literally no different than any other human. Same distribution of intelligence, of, of ideas, of dreams, of, of anything you can think of, same range of emotions. It's, it's, there's no reason to be condescending and, and term them as savages um, or talk about how they live in, in huts that are unsuitable for a civilized man. So that part has not really aged well. Um, it's going to happen when you have a, a book that's 130 years old. Um, but I think there's still a lot we can gain from it. It's capacity for production being given. Every man can have a house of his own. And what is hindering him from having it? And we are soon convinced that every family in Europe could perfectly well have a comfortable house, such as are built in England, in Belgium, or in Pullman City, or else an equivalent set of rooms. A certain number of days' work would suffice to build a pretty little airy house, well fitted up and lighted by gas. Okay, so he's just talking about, let's, let's stop and do the math. Let's, let's actually figure out how much labor 
um, if we're going to still have a, a monetary economy, how much money would, would it take to, to build a sufficient dwelling for a person? Uh, and then let's, let's look at how much effort society would need to do to provide that for every person. Um, it's a good way of just kind of systematically going at the problem rather than just saying, just keep building and let's just, you know, hope that everything works out. Um, so yeah. But nine tenths of Europeans have never possessed a healthy house because. Of and the same is true of people today. Uh, the, the majority of people in America is probably not as, as high as nine tenths anymore. I think it's, it's closer to, well, let's even look it up. Let's look it up right now. Let's see percent of us home ownership. Uh, 65.8% uh, in the US. That's actually a lot better than I thought it was. 65.8%. Um, and that's, that's even up a little bit from last year. Uh, it's the same as, oh, I see. That's as of 2020. Um, but it's been creeping up. Uh, 2017, it was only 64%. Um, but still, that means almost half of people uh, have never owned a home. Um, so, so that this is the, the rate is proportion of occupied households which are occupied by the owners. It's actually a lot better than I thought. Um, but still, let's see. Nine more rows. Oh, oh. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. So it's kind of fluctuated. Uh, let's see, just since 1990, it was down at 64, as high as 69%. And here we see the housing bubble starting to burst until 2008, and then things kind of dropped off until a low in 2016 of 63 but really you know 60 to 70 percent that's been the range for the past three decades at least um but still it could be better it could be everybody everyone deserves the chance uh or everyone deserves to have their own place why not we can we can do that now there's there's more than enough housing for everybody why doesn't everyone deserve a place of their own to, to, to form that stable basis um Think of how much mental health would be solved but if no one ever had to worry that they could end up homeless. Uh, think of how much more empowering that would be to the average worker if the boss couldn't threaten them with, with being thrown out on the street because they always have a place to go back to. These are the sorts of things that, that come into like urban planning and, and issues of, of housing policy. Uh, so I, I believe those are important uh, crossover disciplines to, to study as well because um, they, they affect your, your daily life that's, that's one reason I had gotten into urban planning that's one reason I got my master's in it uh, was because I was just really intrigued by how much it affects your daily life it's, it's basically the management of local government um, the unelected side of, of local government albeit uh, the, the various housing departments and uh, you know department of transportation um, zoning board, uh, all these sorts of things that, that go into urban planning, but, but nonetheless are very impactful. Um, and the, the policies are, are shaped by the people that, that work in the profession in a, in a really big way. Um, so yeah. At all times, common people have had to work day after day to satisfy the needs of their rulers and have never had the necessary leisure or money to build or to have built the home of their dreams. And they can have no houses and will inhabit hovels as long as present conditions remain unchanged. As you see, we proceed contrary to economists who immortalize the so-called laws of production and reckoning up the number of houses built every year demonstrate by statistics that the new built houses not sufficing to meet all demands, nine tenths of Europeans must live in hovels. Let us pass on to food. After having enumerated the benefits accruing from the Actually, division of... Real quick, I want to do a more one-to-one -one comparison. Let's look at the percentage of, of home ownership in the European Union, since he's talking about Europe. Um, mm 
Mm. Wow. Is that real? Wow, that's a, that's a lot higher for these European countries. It's kind of blowing me away here. Whew, going from the highest to the lowest, we have Romania at 95.8% home ownership. That's incredible. Hungary, Montenegro, Slovakia, Lithuania, Croatia, North Macedonia. I didn't even know that was a separate country from Macedonia. Poland, Bulgaria, I mean, these are all, all much higher than the U.S. That's incredible. Huh. Well, I mean, I don't know what the, what the necessarily the cause is. I'm sure there are a great many different causes from country to country. But I would guess that, that it, you know, at least in part, as far as I know, all these are, are countries that have things like... Uh, universal health care so that's that's one less <laughs> source of, of money to be drained away from uh, its average citizens but yeah that'd be interesting to dive into another time but not tonight not tonight let's keep going oops here we go no labor economists tell us the division of labor so that kind of that the, that entire statistic I mean that was just part of Europe let's look at so that was just selected European countries. Uh, let's see. Let's just look at Italians. 72%. So that's closer to the U.S. Uh, let's see. The U.K. 65%. So very close to the U.S. Interesting that the, the more uh, western side of Europe has much lower home ownership than the eastern uh, group of countries. Interesting. I wonder what the reason for that is. Let's see what we got here. Oh, good evening, Alyosha. Uh, how are you doing tonight, friend? Um, everyone go ahead and follow Alyosha. He's a really great leftist streamer. Uh, does all kinds of political content, lots of commentary, especially if there's uh, a political speech going on. Does good coverage of that sort of thing. Uh, he's built a really amazing community for himself. Uh, so go check out Alyosha. I st I, one of these days, I got to set up whatever bots or commands are needed so that I can just do the automatic follow thing. But uh, it, it works just the same, just to, to click on their on their profile name and uh, go ahead and give them a follow. Really appreciate that. Uh, and if also, if you're watching this stream for the first time tonight uh, and you like this sort of thing, please don't forget to to follow me here. Uh, it's, it's an easy thing to forget if you're just trying something out and you're kind of skipping between different channels, but this is the sort of thing we do a lot. And, and aside from theory, every Sunday night, I just kind of do a, a Sunday fun day sort of thing where I'll pick a, a more lighthearted video or at least a, a video that we can be lighthearted about and kind of, you know, if it's, if it's some right wing ghoul, we can rip into them and at least have fun, uh, looking at a really brutal topic. Uh, in fact, last, last Sunday was... Uh, whew, that was quite a ride. We did a, a video on John Doyle, who was a right wing grifter, very much uh, like a, a Christian fascist type. Um, and it was only a 30 minute video, but it took me almost five hours to cover because there was just so much. There, there's like the lies per minute and the misdirection and, and just the complete false statements that he would make was just coming so fast that it took that long to just like pause and like. <laughs> Go through all the reasons why that's wrong, and then play another ten seconds, and then pause. It was, it was, it was an experience, uh, and it just goes to show how how these these right wingers sometimes will just get talking so fast, and they'll hit you with so many quote unquote facts that if you're an uncritical listener, you're already primed to to accept this stuff. You're not even going to really realize what's what's being pumped into your head. Um, and if you're trying to be critical, he, it just goes so fast. They're like, I'm sure I missed some stuff there, even, even going through it with the fine tooth comb like I did. Um, so that was quite an experience. Uh, you can check that out in, in my video archives here on Twitch. That was just the last stream I did. And you can also go to my, my uh, YouTube page as well as my podcast. That'll be coming out on the, on the podcast pretty soon. And it's, it's always bread theory or bread underscore theory, wherever you're at. But I'll, I'll leave the links left we'll a link at the beginning. I'll leave some links at the end, too. Um, so, yeah, well, how are you tonight, Allie? How are, how are things going for you? How is the, how is the streaming life? I see you've been streaming quite a lot. 
uh, lately. And haven't been able to make every stream, but, but I try to come in once in a while when I can. Um, and to the rest of you who may be out there in chat, how are you guys doing tonight? What's on your mind? What's, what's going on in your political world? Or, or whatever you want to talk about, really. How are things for you? Uh, let's keep going. Requires that some men should work at agriculture and others at manufacture. Farmers producing so much, factories so much, exchange being carried on in such a way. They analyze the sale, the profit, the net gain, or the surplus value, the wages, the taxes, banking, and so on. But after having followed them so far, we are none the wiser, and if we ask them, how is it that millions of human beings are in want of bread when every family could grow sufficient wheat to feed 10, 20, and even 100 people annually? They answer us by droning the same anthem, division of labor, wages, surplus value, capital, etc., arriving at the same conclusion, that production is insufficient to satisfy all needs, a conclusion which, if true, does not answer the question, can or cannot man, by his labor, produce the bread he needs? And... As much as it was a, a truth in, in Kropotkin's age that yes, they can they could produce enough for everybody many times over, it is much more true today. Even with our, our many times higher population in the world, we produce way more food than we use. In the U.S., it's, it's pretty disgusting. Up to 40% of food is wasted, uh, much of it before it even makes it to a store shelf, much of it through things like uh, price dumping, where a farmer can't, just can't get a high enough price, uh, and instead of taking a loss to have it distributed out to stores, um, they just bury it. They dump it in a pit and they cover it over, or they pour out the, the milk, in, in the case of milk. None of that has to be. None of that has to be. And today, we, we produce more than enough food to, to feed the entire world. We have more than enough housing in the U.S., it's some ungodly statistic such as, in fact, let's look that up. Let's not even guess at that. Uh, how, much home, how much housing is there for every homeless person in the U.S.? Let's look that up. Okay. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So as of 2010, it was 29 empty properties per homeless person. I don't know how reliable that is, though. But um, let's see. Checkyourfact.org says there are 31 vacant homes for every homeless person in the U.S. Uh, that, was, that looks like it was 2019. Boy, our computer's being slow tonight. Let's go. Here we go. Currently available numbers. Uh, okay. Okay. There are about 31 vacant housing units for every homeless person in the U.S. So we could solve homelessness 31 times over. And that's just homelessness. I mean, there, there's plenty of people that are underhoused, you, you might call it, which have inadequate housing. More people than can really comfortably live in a unit. Subpar living conditions in one way or another. Um, but I think we, you know... I think we could uh, pretty easily solve it all if we really wanted to. Um, and the same is true of anything, any of the basics. Uh, we can make really great mass transit in every city if we wanted to. Uh, we, we pour billions into infrastructure that is basically free to automobiles, uh, free users, uh, or free usage, that is. Think of how many highways you actually have to pay for. Even if you live in a toll state, how much of the roads do you actually have to pay for as a percentage? I'm sure the tolls are just a fraction. Uh, and even what you pay at a toll booth, uh, I've, I've looked this up before as well, there's not a toll booth in America that, that makes as much in tolls as it takes to maintain whatever given stretch of highway. So it's really just a subsidy more than anything. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Oh, hold on. Getting all over the place. Um, so yeah, we, 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 could, we could do these things if we wanted to. We could provide 
healthcare, education, you know, um, access to the internet, all these sorts of things for everybody uh, at at least a, a basic sufficient rate. Um, but we choose not to. We, we instead choose, uh, well, you know, not necessarily a choice. In fact, um, we are made to uh, choose, so to speak, by uh, the powers that be to keep the current system in place instead. And if he cannot, what is hindering him? Here are 350 million Europeans. Hmm. Good question, Eisenhower, uh, 1953. I do have a Discord that I've created. Uh, I am very new to Discord, though, so it's not quite ready yet. Um, I, I, I don't want to give it out to the public yet because I'm not sure that it's, it's as secure as it could be. Uh, and I, I really don't want to be uh, trolled by, by a bunch of reactionaries coming in and, and saying awful stuff that I have to then take time to either deputize mods to kick them out or to kick them out myself. Um, so for now, it's just the, it's just the Twitch chat for now. Um, you can also message me on, on uh, Twitter. You can message me on Facebook. I'll put up my link just right again there. Uh, one second, and I'll put that in the chat. Whoops, wrong one. Oh, oh, so you want to debate. Um, tonight's not really the, the, the time for debating so much. If, if you have some questions that I can quickly answer, that's fine. Uh, but I don't usually like to do debates on, on Theory Night. The, the point is more educational. We're trying to get through uh, the book at hand. Maybe, maybe some Sunday night, though, if you want to have a conversation. Again, debate, that's such a loaded term. Um, <laughs> uh, too often, debates devolve into who can look better and who can come up with the most creative insults. Uh, has very little to do with the actual substance of it. But if you want to just have a conversation, that's fine. I, I assume you're coming at it from a, a different point of view than I, which is also fine. Uh, oh, you're writing a novel on why Wall Street is based. Well, that, that's good for you. Uh, good on you for, for writing. That's, that's, that's a difficult thing to get through for anybody, whatever, whatever the topic is. Um, I'm glad you found a, pa a topic that you are passionate about. I don't happen to think Wall Street's all that based. Um, I think a whole large part of it doesn't really serve any useful function in society. Uh, it, it basically just is betting on, on which stocks are going to go up and which are going to go down and, and trying to make money off of that it has very little to do with actual investment in, in companies that anyone cares about themselves or wants to succeed. Um, and I think, I think, it's basically just it's 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 a a large scale casino for better uh, or worse I think worse um, so yeah that's what I got there profit is amazing yeah it's amazing for the people making the profit not so amazing for the people at at whose expense the profit is made uh, and that's the whole thing about anarchism is we wanna well that's the whole thing about any sort of leftism socialism communism general leftism. We want to stop the exploitation of people by, by those that, that happen to own the means of production. Um, so while it may feel good to make all that money, it may, may open up your life in ways that you could have never dreamed. And while that's great for a small handful of people, um, it comes at the expense of other people. I mean, literally, it comes at the expense of others. It, it only is possible because you have a structural imbalance of power where you can take profit from whatever company you own and decide where it goes and surprise surprise most of the time and most of that profit is being funneled to the top never to trickle down again um, so yeah uh, do I think capitalism is bad for climate change I don't think it's good for climate change that's for sure <sighs> when the profit motive is at the very top when, when as a business owner you are, are trying more than anything to just maximize your return on, on your investment. Everything else comes secondary, and that includes uh, climate change. Um, if you are a business owner and you want to do good, uh, it's, 
it can be a very difficult position if you don't have the regulatory backing to do so. Say you are a coal miner uh, company and you really want, I mean, this is a, a pretty far-fetched scenario, but you really, you really want to do coal as cleanly and as safely as possible. Okay, you, you don't want to, to damage the environment around a coal mine. You want to, to, to do the least amount of impact possible. Well, unless there's, there's regulations that say you have to do a certain thing, like dispose of your tailings in a, in a safe storage area that cannot leak into watersheds, you're going to have to do that. You're, you're just going to have to dump it because all your competitors are going to dump it, you know? your hands are tied by, by a lack of regulation. I know that that may be strange for you to hear, that it's, it's usually the, said the other way around, that regulation ties people's hands. But it also, at the same time, enables companies to, to make better choices. Um, you may not want to, let, let's use a more realistic example. You may be a small-time grocery store. You don't want to pay your employees less than a livable wage. You've done everything you can to, to cut other costs. Um, you, you've found the, the suppliers that, that you can get the best deal from um, for your size operation. And then a Walmart shows up in town and they can get away with, with paying their, their employees minimum wage. They bring a lot of jobs, but they're not great jobs. And because they're so large, they can also link up with suppliers that, that maybe you don't have access to because you can't accept as much product as, as, as they can. So in order to compete, you have to cut somewhere. And eventually that's probably going to come down to things like wages. You may have to cut staff. You may have to cut their pay or their benefits or whatever just to stay afloat. So again, your hands are tied by a lack of regulation. Was Would there be a... a uh, or if it were to be that there was a higher minimum wage, for example, one that's actually a minimum, a, a, a minimum for the standard of living, you wouldn't be able to pay your employees less. So to, just to be in business, you'd have to pay them that minimum wage. And so would Wal Walmart. They couldn't get away with undercutting you then. Um, the same could be true of, of various standards. You, you may ha have an ethical qualm about a certain product, but it happens to be the cheapest product. And now this other store carries it and they're undercutting you on price um, and you have to go through all this extra effort to explain why it is that you're making the ethical choice that ends up costing more. Your hands are tied again by regulation or by lack of regulation that is. Oh boy, you're typing paragraphs here, bud. <laughs> my story's bombastic, my rhetoric's strong. There's only one problem, your theory is wrong. Wow, that rhymed. Very good. I see a little cat in the hat in the making. The wealthiest countries do the most to conserve. They don't. Oh, I, did you copy pasta this from somewhere? Because there's a lot of rhyming schemes going on. Uh, have you ever heard of the Kuznets curve? Have you ever heard of the idea that the most impoverished countries in the world contribute the very least to climate change, even if they have dirtier practices? because they're just consuming a whole lot less. They're, 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 you know, they're making less products. They're, they are uh, <laughs> cutting down less, less forests. Or if they are, it's, it's at the, the behest of um, larger, wealthier com countries. No, no, no. The wealthiest countries are, are responsible for the vast bulk of climate change. The Kuznets curve, property rights, rising living standards, Yes, yes. Oh, the idea that the, the rising tide lifts all boats. The problem is that the bottom never rises at the same rate as the top, so that's a really poor analogy. Uh, it's as though everyone's raising at an equal rate. That's not the case. That's the reason that uh, the minimum wage hasn't gone up in, in 15, 20 years now. It's, it's stayed at, at, at 765, 785, whatever it's at. That's not a rising tide raising all boats equally. That's a rising tide funneling stuff to the top where they're skyrocketing. In some cases, like with Bezos and Musk, literally out of the atmosphere. Um, so that kind of blows that entire theory away. 
the, the bottom part just keeps getting further and further behind, especially as social programs are continuing to be gutted um, or not maintained. As, as the bottom just keeps slipping further and further away, there has to be a point where everything crashes. I mean, for, if for no other reason, then there'll be no one left over to buy a lot of the products and services that the, the wealthy companies rely on. Okay, let's hear the rest of your poem here. <laughs> uh, entrepreneurial innovation. We've talked about innovation already, how it's stifled by things like patent law, where you can have a patent that lasts for 30 years. In some cases, like music can last up to 100 years, where no one can use that same tune for all that time. Think of all the, the creativity that's stifled just because uh, uh, one patent or another has been filed. I mean, there's entire, lawyer, there's entire guilds of lawyers whose entire job it is to, to threaten people with patent lawsuits. You want to talk about innovation? We need to do away with, with these ideas that intellectual property should be privatized rather than given out for the benefit of all. Um, and you need look no further than places like Wikipedia, uh, like various open source, source software, um, collectives, uh, to, to, to find examples of people doing creative work for free because they love it. Now imagine if we had a society where we could empower everyone to be able to do whatever work they felt like. How many more people would choose to do creative things? How many people that may live their life toiling as a, a butcher um, or a factory worker or any number of, of, of so-called low-class positions whose gifts are then just squandered because they never had the opportunity to, to put them in front of the right people. Uh, they were never given a chance. Maybe they came from a place that, that didn't care about education as much or that, that couldn't afford to care about education as much. Um, so, on the contrary, capitalism is very stifling of innovation overall. Think of how many companies once they get big, just make it their business to buy up smaller companies. They don't even innovate themselves. They just buy up the, the smaller people that are innovating. You would think that if capitalism was such an engine of innovation, they'd be doing it themselves as the, as the ones on the top, right? They're the, they're the elite guys, the guys that have made it to the top. Why do they have to rely on all the little guys to, to keep on innovating? That seemed kind of strange. Um, let's keep going. <laughs> a long one. Ah, uh, let's see. Critical tools for improving our environment. Yeah, well, there's a lot of things that are critical for improving our environment um, that we can still do under any sort of leftist society. And in fact, probably do better because we have more people with a seat at the table making the decisions. Uh, just think about if everyone had an equal say about where a company was located. Um, there'd be less of a chance that it'd be located in a neighborhood where it's going to be polluting because those people would, there'd be more people for one thing making that decision, not just someone who's only looking at the bottom line, but there's a greater chance that some of the people at least um, from the proposed community would be part of that company and, and then have a say in, in where it gets located. Um, if more people had more of a say, how many are going to allow that coal company that, that we imagined, that, that I mean, there's plenty of real world examples of, how many of them are just gonna let a coal company pollute entire watersheds? Uh, how many of them are going to want to just ship all of our, our e-waste halfway around the world for it to be disposed of in very toxic ways um, that, that harm the people there? Those people there could have more empowerment to say no and to refuse as well. Uh, how many people would accept sweatshop labor standards if, if they actually had a say in their life, if they actually had a platform to stand on where they wouldn't need to have sweatshop labor to survive? Um, I mean, again and again, I, I don't see how just having innovation necessarily is going to fix climate change. It's, it's, it takes more than that. It takes intention as well. Um, for a problem to be solved, people actually have to care about it being solved, and enough people do. 
Uh, and when, when a certain class of people that makes most of the decisions also is, happens to be the same class that can insulate themselves the most from the effects of, of those decisions, you end up with catastrophes and pollution and climate change just because the people don't have to care who are actually get, getting to make decisions about how companies function. Ooh, only wealthy societies can afford to go green. Oh, there are still tribal societies in this world, my friend. And for the most part, their impact on any climate that they find themselves in is negligible. Um, the poorest societies, again, have the least impact on the environment because they just economically they can't. They can't afford to be, be having their products shipped halfway around the world or back uh, from the factory in their country halfway around the world to a third country and then back, as many U.S. products do. Talk about waste and inefficiency. Talk about uh, polluting the planet in the name of, of profit. It, what you're saying just doesn't add up. Uh, to... to, to if you want a better world, see the unseen. That's it. precisely what I'm trying to do here. The unseen right now is, is this entire side of, of politics that is to the left of capitalism that has been um, very systematically suppressed, um, lied about, manipulated through foreign uh, invasion and, and other forms of foreign intervention, um, on and on and on because uh, all in the name of keeping the, 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 the status quo going, basically. It doesn't even have to be anything particularly pernicious behind it. It could just be, we like our rich friends, we want them to keep making money, and this country is you know, wanting labor rights now, that's going to affect their factories, we better help them plan a coup. You know, that sort of thing. It's, it's nothing beyond that, they just, they have friends, they want them to succeed. Um, they themselves have businesses they want to succeed and they don't want things like human rights to get in the way um, or any sort of social progress. So, where are we at? Uh, even carbon will bend to the creative destruction with entrepreneurship. I mean, that's a nice thought. It hasn't yet. Um, in the means of production, incentive is better than force. That's a strange thing from a capitalist perspective to be saying because how are you making people work jobs like McDonald's um, where you get burned with fryer grease, you have nasty customers who talk down to you all day long, uh, and at the end of the day, you take home such a pittance that no place in America could you actually live off of that one 40-hour week salary. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna talk to me about, about incentive being better than force? Are, are you just meaning the incentive to not starve? That's better than force? Because I don't see a difference. To me, that, that's coercive. To me, that's saying, accept this wage or, or die, basically. We've seen that revealed with the pandemic and the, the upping of um, unemployment benefits. Oh, all of a sudden, all these, these, these undesirable jobs, undesirable because they're poorly compensated, are not getting filled. Imagine that. People would rather not have to go to work for a wage that they cannot live on. They would, they would rather take money from the government um, and be secure and preserve their body, preserve their dignity, preserve their mind uh, than have to take these jobs. Uh, so, yeah, I agree. Incentive is better than, than coercion, which is why we should be putting everyone on an equal starting platform, right? It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to parse out what is coercive and what is not if someone is just scraping by to live. Um, if someone doesn't really have a viable alternative, where then is the choice? And if there's no choice, how is it not coercive? How is it not force, right? 
where's where's the lack of coercion in the 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 capitalist form of of enterprise you know it's it's a top-down system you don't like what your boss does you think you're being treated unfairly unsafely you think they're breaking the law at, at your expense potentially what are your options you can't just walk into the, the the boss's office and say you need to fix this or i'm leaving because alone they don't care they'll say go leave i'll help you pack security will escort you off you have half an hour to collect your things okay don't talk to me about force that's 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 coercive that's forceful that's a system where one person or a handful of people make all the decisions for many times more people that's force that's not freedom freedom is actually having a say in your daily life freedom is having a say in in the way that that your business is run a real say not just a suggestion box not just a hey let's go around the room and share our thoughts in a vote a, a binding vote about things like compensation benefits working conditions number of hours each in position is required to work per week um, and how to distribute whatever profit is left over you know a real say in these sorts of things that's where you, you get away from ideas of, of force and coercion and when you get towards incentive at that point every every employee every worker employee every worker owner that is uh, in the company under say a, a worker owned cooperative system now has the incentive for, for their company to make more money or, or to do better at whatever it is they do to, to be more financially viable because it literally means more for them okay now they have a stake in the company's success you think uh, an average person at McDonald's cares at all how McDonald's does how you know they probably couldn't tell you who the CEO of McDonald's was let alone care about about you know them making more money why would they care it makes no difference to them in their personal life the McDonald's could rise it could fall it wouldn't really matter to them it makes no material difference to them turn McDonald's into a worker-owned cooperative now every single burger that's sold means a, is is you know a fraction of a, a penny more in every worker's pocket and that adds up you know that's that's where real incentives come in that's where real choice and and the absence of force comes in moving on though let's see what else jobs should be well compensated and health care should be free absolutely agree perennial green that helps everyone employee and employer yes that's another form of, of coercion that's that's a good very good point thank you perennial green that's another form of coercion and and force is tying your medical life to your employer so that you're afraid to quit especially if you have a chronic health condition which a lot of americans do that means you have to think twice about is you, know, you always have to weigh is is leaving this job potentially worth a huge reduction in my quality of life or potentially death you know if you're dependent on something like insulin or other medication that you need on the regular you have to to, to really analyze your options before you think about switching employers that to me is coercion that to me is, is tying you to a system that you you are then dependent on in a really big way in a really material concrete way um, whereas if everyone just had health care paid for by taxes, we're not talking about just free as though it blinks out of the air, but paid for by taxes, you'd, you'd still have all the same medical people. It's just the person paying the bill at the end of the day would be the government instead of you. Um, what if we had a system like that? Isn't that a lot more of an incentive to choose a job that you like? Isn't that, uh, doesn't that give you a much better position when you want to change jobs you don't ever have to worry then about your life potentially ending or, or becoming so diminished in quality that that existence is just brutal for you that takes that all away that frees up people we're talking about freedom here okay we like freedom we like democracy on this channel we like self-determination these are things that are only possible when you provide the basics for people at a minimum and give them choice 
a, a real choice and a real say, a democratic binding say in the runnings of their workplace. That's it. If you're not for choice, if you're not for democracy, I mean, those are positions, but you kind of have to justify why. Why you don't think certain people deserve to have a say in their lives. Why you think other people know better. All right. Uh, that's, that's enough ranting for now. Let's, uh, let's move on. If there's anything else on anyone's mind related to the material, preferably, but it doesn't have to be. This is kind of a shorter chapter, so we're already a third of the way through it. Um, so we have a little bit of, little bit of wiggle room tonight. I usually like to go just about a couple hours, and we're an hour and 15 in. Um, so yeah, we can be a little bit more loose tonight. Um, but, but we will definitely try and finish it up by 9 o'clock, uh, Central Standard Time, that is. They need so much bread, so much meat, wine, milk, eggs, and butter every year. They need so many houses, so much clothing. This is the minimum of their needs. Can they produce all this? And if they can, will there then be left sufficient leisure for art, science, and amusement? In a word, for everything that is not comprised in the category of absolute necessities. If the answer is in the affirmative, what hinders them going ahead? What must they do to remove obstacles? Is time needed? Let them take it. But let us not lose sight of the aim of production, the satisfaction of needs. If the most imperious needs... Of and there you have it. Um, just as, as he orients the revolution towards fulfilling the needs of, of the revolutionaries, um, way back, oh, one of the first, like, three or four chapters, he was, he was talking about how the revolution should go and what we should keep our eyes on during a revolution. Um, and he was saying that if you spend all your time on bureaucracy and, and who's going to hold power in the new system and, and on and on and on, you are missing the entire point. Your focus needs to be on fulfilling the promises of that revolution. So providing all the basic necessities for every citizen. That way you invest the revolution in the people that, that commenced it for you. The people that actually did the work. Again, we're talking about the workers actually being enfranchised. And in the work of war, there's always going to be the most people again at the bottom. So why not try and compensate them just as much as you compensate uh, the people that were the, the field generals or whatever. Um, and if you make sure that you are investing in the revolution, you're going to have a populace that is much more resistant to change uh, back to an old form uh, than, than they otherwise would be. They're going to they're gonna say, uh, you know, someone will come up and say, hey, let's, let's, let's just go back to that, uh, that capitalism. Huh? That, that seemed to work okay for us, and this is kind of messy right now, right? Well, no, you, you have a now a, a large populace that has the things they need to survive, that, uh, that are, are not only willing to fight to keep their situation, but able to because they have all the food they need. They have all the shelter they need. They're, they're physically healthy enough and, and, and mentally fortified enough and, and spiritually uh, fortified enough because they've seen promises fulfilled that they're going to fight to, to keep things from backsliding into forms of exploiter exploited uh, relationships so that, that that goes both from revolutions from within some some upstart former capitalist decides they want to grab their power back much more likely to be be resisted by the people uh, you have an invading army from without you have a lot more people that are willing and able to i mean it doesn't matter what size the the army is guerrilla warfare is an effective way to hold off entire militaries, even the most powerful militaries in the world. And if you have a people that really believe and have really had a taste of what it means to, to have these sorts of revolutionary promises fulfilled, you're going to have a populace that's, that's much more willing to stand up and much more able to, again, it's, it's, it's both willing and able. You, you fulfill two things. You have two safeguards in, in one fell swoop of just providing uh, the the fulfilling, that is, the, the promises of the revolution, basically. Let's continue. If man remain unsatisfied, what must he do to increase the productivity of his work? And is there no other cause? Might it not be that production, having lost sight of the needs of man, has strayed in an absolutely wrong direction, and that its organization is at fault? 
And as we can prove that such is the case, let us see how to reorganize production so as to really satisfy all needs. This seems to us the only right way of facing things, the only way that would allow of political economy becoming a science, the science of social physiology. It is evident that when this science will treat of production, as it is at present carried on by civilized nations, by Hindu communes, or by savages, it will hardly state facts otherwise than the economists state them now. That is to say, as a simple descriptive chapter, analogous to descriptive chapters of zoology and botany. But if this chapter were written to throw light on the economy of energy, necessary to satisfy human needs, the chapter would gain in precision as well as in descriptive value. It would clearly prove the frightful waste of human energy under the present system, and would admit, as we do, that as long as this system exists, the needs of humanity will never be satisfied. So yeah, I, 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 I think I gather what he's saying is that if you have to actually take these economic systems apart and, and look at capitalism through a, a more scientifically rigorous lens, we will look at all, we will, we will come to find all the waste that, that is, is existent in the current system. And we would, we would come to find that a, a, a different system, such as the one he describes, where people don't have to toil as much but can still produce as much, if not more, is entirely possible um, and is perhaps favorable. Um, how's everybody doing with the, the language of the, of the book itself? This, this was written. Um, I always forget the, the time. I, you know, dates never really stuck with me when it came to history class. Uh, so let's look up the, the actual date of the conquest of bread again. I believe it was the, I want to say it was the 1890s. Uh, do, 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 the conquest of bread. Let's find out. 1892. There you go. So yeah, this book is, oh boy, almost exactly 130 years old. Um, so yeah. There's going to be a lot that, that, that's changed. This is academic language. Maybe everyone's not necessarily familiar with it. So uh, that's, a, that's a good point to, to, to bring up, too. If ever there's a term that you don't understand um, or a concept that, that you're struggling with, don't be afraid to, to, to ask in the chat. I'm always happy to, to, to answer those sorts of questions. I was always helping, helping you educate yourself is, is, is my number one goal. Um, so I don't ever want you to feel like I'm going to be annoyed. Like, Oh, we've already covered that. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. We, you know, what is communism? What is anarchy? These sorts of things that that's okay to ask about. Um, what is the labor theory of value? You know, you're, I always want you to be able to ask questions here. I don't want you to feel like I'm ever going to put you down for, for not knowing something. Cause I never would. Um, on the other hand, if you're if you're a troll coming in and, and coming off all half cocked and uh, talking about Vuvuzela or, or whatever your, your favorite right wing talking point is, I may not be as charitable to you. But if you're coming in good faith, even if you're coming from a different perspective, I'll say that too. Um, I'll try my best to, to, to meet you at that level, um, and I will definitely try my best to educate you and, and help you understand these concepts better because they don't come easy to everyone and there's there's no shame in that there's there's nothing wrong with that at all uh we all have have different entry points we all have different experiences that uh can make it easier or 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 harder to absorb the information so yeah just thought i'd throw that out there so yeah any questions just just go ahead and post them in the, the comments there because like i said almost a 130 year old book um that's that's a long time that's a long time for something to uh, well, it's a long time for something to still have re relevance, too. I, I should be so lucky that, that any of the things I ever say or do are, are still remembered in 130 years. Um, so in that respect, it is, it's quite a feat that he's done here. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, go back into the chapter. Like I say, don't hesitate to ask questions. I always appreciate them. Uh, or just relate your own experience, too. That's always fine as well. Um, if there's per perhaps other books that, that you think relate well to this or are a good counterpoint even to this that you think I should check out, always, always happy to hear those recommendations. Um, if you're feeling like you have a different interpretation of the text, always, always uh, happy to hear that as well. Um, 
that's the thing about these these theory books is you can have dozens hundreds of people giving their opinion on the same text and for the most part it only makes the the text stronger and richer and and more applicable to to people's lives uh it's not going to take away at all it's one thing that i like about doing this sort of thing um i never feel like you know if another theory person pops up that i have to somehow compete with them or i have to have the right opinion while they have the wrong opinion no i'm more than happy to to help platform them and help them get listeners or viewers as well because i think it only helps the the cause really let's continue though bye the point of view we see would be entirely changed behind the loom that weaves so many yards of cloth behind the steel plate perforator and behind the safe in which dividends are hoarded we should see man the artisan of production more often than not excluded from the feast he has prepared for others we should also understand that the standpoint being wrong so-called laws of value and exchange are but a very false explanation of events as they happen nowadays and that things will come to pass okay so so here are the the concepts of, of value and exchange so use value and exchange value an item is worth whatever people are willing to exchange currency for or, or another product or service for uh, uh, an item is worth uh, however, however much use a particular end person can get out of it. These, these are the very basic strokes, what those concepts mean. And it's, it's the, the concepts of value that uh, capitalists tend to, to favor a whole lot um, because it, it allows them to then view workers as just another piece of machinery be, to be bought and sold. Basically, they're just one more component. They, they, you know, their, their use value is, is how much... <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm not applying that right, so I won't, I won't continue on. But, uh, yeah. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, uh, the labor theory of value. So, so how much work is put into a particular product or service, um, and then whatever it, it ends up getting sold for reveals the, the worth of that labor, basically. Um, and it's to be divvied up according to who does whatever labor to produce that good or service. Uh, so that's another way of doing it. I mean, Kropotkin's kind of beyond all of those. He, he wants to do away with these sorts of values at all where and, and get it to where need is really the only value. So what determines what production is undertaken, what determines what services are undertaken is all down to needs. What does society need? What do your local neighbors need? Um, how can you fulfill that? Basically that sort of thing. Um, and I'm not actually sure if there's a particular phrase for, for that, uh, a particular term for that um, conceptualization of value. I, I don't know if it'd be a needs-based value or needs theory of value. I don't really know. Um, that is one area of, of leftism that I haven't explored yet. So if you do know, uh, I'd love it for you to, to point me in the right direction. Very differently when production is organized in such a manner as to meet all needs of society. There is not one single principle of political economy that does not change its aspect if you look at it from our point of view. Take for instance overproduction, a word which every day re-echoes in our ears. Is there a single economist and again, as, as we've talked about with, with food overproduction, still a problem under capitalism today. Um, you can miss allocate, or you can uh, misinterpret or miss predict. You, you can have a bad prediction about the way a particular commodity or, or a good or any sort of good or service is, is uh, going to be needed or, or demanded by the, the market. And you can overproduce and end up not getting, not being able to get a, a good enough price uh, to make it worth your while. Um, it's, it's, it's still a problem that, that's not solved by, by capitalism. Um, so, something to keep in mind. Academician or candidate for academical honors who has not supported arguments, proving that economic crises are due to overproduction, that at a given moment, more cotton, more cloth, more watches are produced than are needed. Yeah, and then this can, you know, in extreme cases, this can lead to entire companies folding uh, if they just cannot find a market for 
their particular good or service for long enough. Uh, this can cause large companies to go under even, and a lot of people to be out of work all at once. It can cause huge economic disruption. Kind of, it, it's part of the boom and bust cycle of, of capitalism that is quite prevalent, uh, especially the less regulated forms of, of capitalism. Have not men accused of rapacity the capitalists who are obstinately bent on producing more than can possibly be consumed? But on careful examination, all these reasonings prove unsound. In fact, is there a commodity among those in universal use which is produced in greater quantity than need be? Examine, one by one, all commodities sent out by countries exporting on a large scale, and you will see that nearly all are produced in insufficient quantities for the inhabitants of the countries exporting them. It is not a surplus of wheat that the Russian peasants send to Europe. The most plentiful harvests of wheat and rye in European Russia only yield enough for the population. And as a rule, the peasant deprives himself of what he actually needs when he sells his wheat or rye to pay his rent and taxes. It is not a surplus of coal that England sends to the four corners of the globe, because only three quarters of a ton per head of population annually remain for home domestic consumption, and millions of Englishmen are deprived of fire in the winter, or have only just enough to boil a few vegetables. In fact, setting aside useless luxuries, there is in England which exports more than any other country but a single commodity in universal use, cottons, whose production is sufficiently great to perhaps exceed the needs of the community. Yet when we look upon the rags that pass for wearing apparel worn by over a third of the inhabitants of the United Kingdom, we are led to ask ourselves whether the cottons exported would not, within a trifle, suit the real needs of the population. As a So, you know, I think what he's trying to do there is separate needs from demands. So there may be a high demand for fashion, which, which ends up eating all of uh, a particular resource such as textiles, uh, but if you were to actually look at what people need, um, starting with the bare minimum and then moving up from there to see how much could evenly be distributed throughout the population, uh, I think what he's saying is that you would find that perhaps that, that looks a bit different uh, in the final calculus, that, that in fact there is a lot more than people need to have. Um, yeah, little point there. Rule. It is not a surplus that is exported, though it may have been so originally. The fable of the barefooted shoemaker is as true of nations as it was formerly of artisans. We export the necessary commodities, and we do so because the workmen cannot buy with their wages what they have produced, and pay besides the rent and interest to the capitalist and the banker. Not only does the ever-growing need of comfort remain unsatisfied, but strict necessaries are often wanting. Surplus production does, therefore, not exist, at least not in the sense which is given to it by the theorists of political economy. Taking another point, all economists tell us that there is a well-proved law. Man produces more than he consumes. After he has lived on the proceeds of his toil, there remains a surplus. Thus, a family of cultivators produces enough to feed several families, and so forth. For a well, and, you know... Just from a very intuitive, lo an intuitive level, that has to be true. In order to have a civilization, you have to have more calories being produced in food than everyone needs, especially since there's going to be fluctuations in fl food availability. Uh, you know, the, that's one of the, the factors that, that people speculate was the beginning of civilization was the, the rise of agriculture and the ability to have things like grain stores. Um, so people could set aside food and kind of even out the, the, the peaks and valleys of, of seasonally available food. Um, so to keep any sort of society going, uh, I mean, obviously people can't be starving to death more often than they are meeting their caloric needs. So. Press this oft-repeated sentence has no sense. If it meant that each generation leaves something to future generations, it would be true. Thus, for example, a farmer plants a tree that will live, maybe, for 30, 40, or 100 years, and whose fruits will still be gathered by the farmer's grandchildren. Or, he clears a few acres of virgin soil, and we say that the heritage of future generations has been increased by that much. Roads, bridges, canals, his house, and his furniture are so much wealth bequeathed to succeeding generations. 
But this is not what is meant. We are told that the cultivator produces more than he need consume. Rather should they say that, the state having always taken from him a large share of his produce for taxes, the priest for tithe, and the landlord for rent, a whole class of men has been created who formerly consumed what they produced, save what was set aside for unforeseen accidents, or expenses incurred in the afforestation, roads, etc., but who, day to day, are compelled to live very poorly from hand to mouth, the remainder having been taken from them by the state, the landlord, the priest, and the usurer. Let us also observe that if the needs of the individual are our starting point, we cannot fail to reach communism, an organization which enables us to satisfy all needs in the most thorough and economical way, while if we start from our present method of production, and aim at gain and surplus value without taking into account if production corresponds to the satisfaction of needs, we necessarily arrive at capitalism, or at most collectivism, both being but diverse forms of our wages system. In fact, when we consider the needs of the individual and society, and the means which man has resorted to in order to satisfy them during his varied phases of development, we are convinced of the necessity of systematizing our efforts, instead of producing haphazard as we do nowadays. It grows evident that the appropriation by a few of all riches, not consumed and transmitted from one generation to another, is not in the general interest. We can state as a fact that owing to these methods the needs of three-quarters of society are not satisfied, and that the present waste of human strength is the more useless and the more criminal. We discover, moreover, that the most advantageous use of all commodities would be for each of them to go first for satisfying those needs which are the most pressing, that, in other words, the so-called value of use in a commodity does not depend on a single whim, as has often been affirmed, but on the satisfaction it brings to real needs. Communism, that is to say, an organization which would correspond to a view of consumption, production, and exchange taken as a whole, therefore becomes the logical consequence of the comprehension of things, the only one, in our opinion, that is really scientific. A society that will satisfy the needs of all, and which will now know how to organize production, will also have to make a clean sweep of several prejudices concerning industry, and first of all, of the theory often preached by economists, the division of labor theory, which we are going to discuss in the next chapter. This has been a production of... Hey, and that's the end of the chapter for this week. So what did everyone think? Um, do you have questions left over? Was that, was that a difficult one to, to get through? There's a lot of economic terms thrown out there. You know, I'm not going to claim that I have a perfect grasp on each one of them either. Um, but we can, together, probably learn a lot more uh, than we could just on our own. That's part of the, part of the deal here. Um, did you find it useful? Is, is that a, a useful chapter? Uh, how, how do you like it compared to some of the other chapters as well? Um, any thoughts on that? 8.40, all right. So we're making good time tonight. Uh, so while you guys are, are thinking about that sort of thing, I'll just go ahead and bring up my link tree once more. So if you want to follow the things that I do, well, first of all, if, you, if you're liking this channel, go ahead and give me a, a follow. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything. And uh, you'll make sure to be alerted to uh, all of my live streams so you can come and, and add to the discussion and, and we can all uh, learn together and, and build a community online here. Um, so beyond that, why don't you go ahead and follow me in the various places that, that I do content. So in addition to, um, in addition to the stream, I also do, uh, let's see, where do I want to go to? Oh, right here. Uh, so in addition to the stream, I have a presence on YouTube. I, I, I archive all of my videos and I, and I organize them into playlists. So you can open it like a book basically. Um, so each book I will take and make it a separate playlist for. I, I take the audio from these streams. I make a podcast out of it. And also, uh, I'm on Facebook quite a lot. So you can, uh, you can contact me there. It's, it's bread underscore theory on Facebook as well. 
take a look at that right now. So I've been trying to, to up my posting rate a bit here, just keep people more engaged. If you have other people that, that might be interested in this sort of comment or content, uh, please, please, please tell, tell at least one person. If you really like this sort of thing, tell at least one person uh, about what you, what you saw here, what you, what you learned here, and what you're thinking about. Um, and, you know, we can, we can just keep building this little by little. Uh, one, of the, one of the principles of, of permaculture that I, that I find often most applicable to the, the various sorts of design work that I've done, including designing the, the progress of this Twitch stream, is uh, look for small and slow solutions. Uh, the idea being that rather than just you know, uh, you know, one size fits all top-down solution, let's let's just implement it and 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 let it go. Be very slow and deliberate about the way that that you grow things and, and come up with uh, solutions. Be willing to wait for things to to mature. It's especially important when it when it comes to food production because a lot of the things that are super productive, like trees, uh, they take a while to to get established. So. Um, so yeah, let's, let's slowly build this, this community together. Uh, so yeah, so this is my Facebook page. You can also find uh, a couple different groups that I do on Facebook. One being, uh, which one did I pull up? Uh, left pod posting. If you yourself have a, a leftist podcast of any kind, or, or you're just a fan of them. Uh, you can come on over to Left Pod Posting, the Facebook group, and we, we talk about that sort of thing all the time. There's a bunch of different uh, content creators that post on a regular basis, like uh, Political Pain. He does videos, but but also likes to, to post in, in that group as well. Um, and, and it's just a fun time. So in addition to that, we have Left Signal Boost, which we just just crossed. Uh, 520 members now and that's more for boast, uh, boosting every sort of leftist content um, so not just podcasts but we got memes we got you know and in, in both groups we have memes we try to keep it light um, so come check that out as well left signal boost on Facebook um, and then we have uh, you know a few more links up there so check it out l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash bread underscore theory um I guess I'm just gonna kind of wrap it up for the night. Then this is a, a little bit of a shorter one, which is which is cool. Um, it was definitely a shorter chapter, so no big surprise there. Uh, if you if you are enjoying this book, if you're enjoying my content, uh, my next stream is gonna be on Sunday. It's gonna be at seven o'clock. Well, actually, no, probably gonna go earlier than that. So best best place to follow me is either on uh, Facebook or Twitter. And, and I'll, I'll make an announcement about when I go live there. So probably sometime in the, the late afternoon, early evening, kind of depends. It is Father's Day, so I'm going to be uh, spending some time with my kids. Um, and we're just going to do a Sunday fun day sort of thing. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And if you like the, the theory thing, again, we do this every Friday at uh, around, uh, I try to be very close to uh, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. And we try to run... Uh, no more than two hours, you know. We don't want to make it so overwhelming for you that, that it feels like a, a slog to get through. But that, that just tends to be how it goes. Um, if any of you are interested in being a guest on, on the podcast and, and going through one of these chapters with me, uh, as, as, you know, definitely interested in people that, that have uh, the same or similar opinions, but definitely at the same time willing to take people that are, are coming from a different background or of a different philosophy, but are, are willing to discuss in, in good faith, good faith being the key part there, uh, the, the, the different issues that I brought up within the chapter. Um, so if you're interested in that, give me a, give me a shout out. Uh, probably, probably the best place to do that is again, gonna be either on Twitter or the Bread Theory Facebook page. Um, that's where I'm gonna be most likely to see it. So if you, if you feel you wanna do that, I, uh, I only do, voice calls because I, I my my uh, computer here is not quite strong enough to do the the video of both my camera and and someone calling in at the same time so if you're worried about being on camera 
don't be because it's just going to be a Colin sort of thing. Um, and if you never read it, doesn't matter. If you've read a whole bunch of theory, that's great too. I, I always learn something from every perspective that, that uh, people are coming from that I bring on the show. So yeah, go ahead and give me a, 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 a shout out somewhere and uh, I will get you in the lineup. So 